So our next speaker is Mark McLeod. He's been helping fund, grow, and exit venture-backed startups. He's also the man behind companies like Shopify, FreshBooks, and Tungo. I give you now Mark McLeod, who will present to you the exit, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Thank you so much. Warm welcome of applause for Mark McLeod. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So my wife told me this morning that there are two kinds of public speakers, those that are nervous and those that are liars. So that was really comforting for my wife this morning. Um, so as Lana mentioned, uh, I've been funding, growing, and exiting venture-backed startups since uh, 1999. Uh, had a lot of success over the years, was the first CFO at uh, Shopify, most recently was CFO at FreshBooks. In between, I spent three years on the dark side as a VC at Real Ventures. And uh, now I lead a company called SurePath Capital Partners, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, so today we're talking about exits. Uh, we're going to cover a few things, kind of what's happening. We're going to give you some actual data in terms of what's happening with Canadian exits. I'm going to focus specifically on information technology. So if you're like a clean tech person or something else that's atoms instead of bits, this isn't for you. I'm strictly a, a bits guy. I'm also going to talk about some case studies, some actual exits that have taken place and kind of how they went down and what kind of actionable insights you can take from those and just kind of lessons learned as you think about exiting your business. And before I start, how many people are founders here? Okay, awesome. Um, have any of you had an exit before? All right, perfect, that makes a lot of sense. Good. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, running SurePath Capital Partners, I launched this in May of last year, a very unique advisory firm that helps companies raise growth capital and helps them exit all in a non-sketchy, non-investment banker way. Uh, we are focused exclusively on software as a service, e-commerce, and marketplace companies. The commonality across all those three is they're very data-driven. They have lots of little knobs and levers you can twist and turn to optimize those businesses. And investors and buyers love the visibility that comes from having all those knobs and levers. We have 26 of those companies as clients. Uh, we've raised a bunch of money already and have a bunch of exits happening uh, as we speak. We'll skip the infomercial. So let's talk about what's happening. So actual exit data and trends. As I mentioned, this is for the Canadian kind of software market. So this is pretty small here, but what you're seeing is, is kind of the last two years, kind of Q1 2013 through to end of 2015, exits by type, by quarter. The takeaway here is you're seeing, with the exception of two quarters, single digit exits every quarter, so kind of sub 10. And uh, there's, over that two year period, there are 94 exits, and only two of them were IPOs, which was Canaxis and My Dear Shopify. Uh, the rest are acquisitions. And just to give you a sense for kind of relative context, you know, so the, the US market, generally speaking, is 10 times larger than the Canadian market. There were 664 IT exits in the US last year. So kind of relatively, we are underperforming when it comes to exiting in Canada. Next, again, a bit of an eye chart, but I'm looking at the ratio between companies that are funded and exits. And again, this is over a two-year time frame. I think if you expanded it out over a longer time frame, maybe you'd see a different story. But you're seeing kind of a consistent 10 to 1 ratio between companies getting funded and companies that are exiting. If you're a VC, you don't love this. You know, every time you make an investment, you want to crush it. You want to exit that company. And this is actually why VCs in particular are looking for that kind of 10x return. They're looking for it because the vast majority of investments that they make don't work out, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And so they need the winners to make up for the ones that don't work out. This is also why if you've tried to raise venture before, maybe you've struggled, and even though you have a perfectly good business, it's just not a business that you know, is venture scaled. It's because venture capitalists are looking for 
those kinds of hyper growth businesses that can deliver the massive returns. And this is why, it's because most of the businesses that they fund don't exit. In terms of who's buying, so a little over half of the buyers of Canadian IT companies in the last two years have been publicly traded companies, and 46% have been private, so kind of other privately held startups. I don't actually love this trend. You know, most private companies don't have the resources to pay a lot of money for your startup. So what that tells me is that most of these exits are pretty small. Like maybe it's another startup going to an, another startup that's a little bit further along. And as a founder, that kind of sucks because, you know, today all the risk is in your hands. You own your shares in your company and for better or for worse, it's under your control. So now you're going to trade your totally illiquid shares in your company for illiquid shares in someone else's company. And now your fate is in their hands, even though you have a role to play. Some of those deals do involve cash, but in all cases, there's kind of, there's stock as well. And in terms of kind of just breakdown of where the buyers are coming from, so just under two-thirds of the buyers in the last two years were American, uh, just under a quarter were Canadian, and, uh, and the balance are kind of from anywhere and everywhere. Uh, here's some of the buyers that have bought our companies over the last two years. Uh, you know, a couple of takeaways there. First of all, if you go further out in time, it used to be that Google bought a lot of companies. If you go really far back in time, the most active buyer of Canadian, com Canadian software companies was IBM. And uh, neither of them are, t are anywhere to be found in our list in the last two years. The other takeaway is that um, most of these companies have only made one deal. So it's not like they are actively out you know, with a kind of an aggressive M&A program looking for companies in Canada. It's just been opportunistic. It's just kind of happened. And so no kind of super active buyers. Next, we look at kind of how old are the companies by the time they reach an exit. And, you know, 35, this is kind of 94 exits here. So call it a third of them exited inside five years. And then uh, a little under, I guess, around a quarter exited kind of from six to 10 years. And you'll see this, some of them, I was, I was surprised, like t 10 of the 94 companies were more than 20 years old by the time they exited. So I thought that was pretty bizarre. I published a post uh, yesterday or the day before about the IT exits that took place uh, last month in February. And there was a 34-year-old company in that list. So I guess good things sometimes take time. Exits by value. So this is where I'm going to burst the bubble in the room. So, you know, if you read TechCrunch too much, you think that exits happen inside three years and you're going to be a billionaire and, you know, all that good stuff. But unfortunately, the vast majority of exits are pretty modest. Out of the 94 exits that have happened in the last two years, about two-thirds of them have no disclosed value. What that usually means is the transaction is really small. Sometimes it means it's actually a good transaction, but the buyer is so unbelievably massive that the deal is kind of immaterial to them, so they don't have to report it. Um, another full quarter did have a disclosed value, but it was less than $50 million. As a VC, these are like not the kind of deals you're looking for. This is a failure. Maybe for a really small fund, like Real Ventures, a seed stage startup, you know, a seed stage fund, if you're selling a company for 50, that's fine. If you're Novia, if you're Omers, if you're any of kind of the big tier one US funds, this is a sad day if you sell a company for 50 million bucks because it's kind of irrelevant. Um, and you know, only one of the exits in the last two years was kind of greater than 150 million bucks. So kind of not a great news story there in terms of exit value. I'm sorry? Uh, it's an IPO, it's a uh, Shopify. Um, valuations. So these are kind of multiples. Um, what I'm looking here is the top graph is kind of the value, the enterprise value of your company, so how much your company is worth divided by your revenues to give you a sense for kind of the multiple. And it's the same thing in the bottom, but it's enterprise value divided by profit. I know profit is like this really foreign concept to most startups, but you know, real companies actually generate a profit. 
The takeaway here, you know, if you look at software, there's a really big range from like 1.6 times uh, revenue all the way up to seven and a half times revenue. And the thing that differentiates where you are on that continuum is really, you know, the gross margin level of the business, so how profitable is your revenue stream, and then more than anything else, your growth rate. Stock markets, public and private, reward growth above all else. That's been especially true in the last two years. You're seeing things kind of cool down a little bit, especially in the private markets, because they got a bit ahead of themselves, and that's why if you probably reading lots of kind of doomsday stories these days about the VC market. I think people were chasing growth a little bit too much and willing to spend whatever it took to get there. But that notwithstanding, stock markets are always chasing growth. Um, IT services, I won't spend any time on that, but communications and networking trade at much lower multiples because there's hardware and they're complex, you know, lower gross margin businesses. Um, so let's talk about some case studies. Terrascale, this is a scalable storage company that I was involved in as an investor and CFO uh, a while ago. We had raised a Series A round and um, the business was sell uh, really complex software that would take massive amounts of data and send it through massive kind of server farms in, in real time in parallel. And we were out raising a Series B and actually got really far into that process. So far that we had a term sheet, we were doing legals, we had even picked where the closing dinner was going to be and when the first board meeting was going to happen. And then at that 11th hour, uh, a buyer named Rackable Systems kind of showed up out of nowhere and made a pretty crazy offer. And, you know, we had a decision to make. Do we take this Series B, which is, you know, all but done, or do we take this, do we take this offer? And when we looked at it, um, we felt that it would, or we being the founder specifically, because he was still a large shareholder, felt that it would take him years to maybe get to the same point where he was gonna be if he sold the business today. And the thing that made them want to buy us is first of all, we had meaningful, differentiated, you know, IP protected technology. We had built a better mousetrap. Uh, second, we had some joint customers. We solved a real pain for them. They knew it. We helped them win accounts. We helped them keep accounts. Uh, they knew that we had alternatives. You know, often, most often, in fact, when you are approached by a buyer, the buyer knows that you're running out of cash, you probably can't get other buyers, you have no alternatives, and they'll squeeze you. But we actually had a Series B lined up. And they were very motivated. You know, they were competing against Dell and HP, in kind of the blade server market, that's a super competitive, low margin market. They were the smallest player and they were trying to differentiate themselves. And they had also hired an investment bank to make this deal happen. And if you know any bankers, they'll sell their mother to close a deal. So we knew that they wanted to get this done. And uh, the deal did get done. We actually delivered one of those fabled 10X returns uh, that VCs are looking for. Um, the founder uh, hasn't worked a day in his life since. He's got a bunch of nice cars. He divides his time between Montreal and Miami. And, um, and so it was a great win. But I can't help but thinking, what if we had kept going? Because maybe it would have been the next network appliance or some other you know, massive market leading infrastructure company. So you'll never know, I guess. Next is Local Mind. This was uh, an investment I made at Real Ventures. It was kind of a location-based social thing, massive engagement, uh, but pre-revenue, not, not a penny of revenue. And um, as we thought about kind of preparing for the Series A, we really worried about how this company could be a long-term, standalone, viable company. And so we encouraged the company to just have some biz dev discussions, see where they go, and uh, just start talking to kind of product leaders at other companies. Uh, one of the companies that really kind of latched onto this was Airbnb. And, uh, you know, the whole thing with local mind is, you know, you could be in San Francisco and ask, hey, where are the best restaurants or where's the best Scottish restaurant? I know there's no such thing, but anyway, best Scottish food restaurant in San Francisco. And then some local person in the community would answer that for you. And they thought this would be a really interesting way to kind of drive engagement and enhance the experience for people who were booking 
you know, trips through Airbnb. So we took this company that was totally speculative, no real revenue model that we could think of, and we sold it to Airbnb. And so far, because Airbnb is one of those unicorns, we are up 25 times on that investment, which is pretty awesome uh, for, for VCs. And so kind of what made that happen, we had massive free user growth. Like we weren't spending a penny on customer acquisition. It was a viral thing, uh, lots of engagement. Uh, but we were unsure about the long-term prospects of it. So like I said, we encouraged, encouraged the founders to speak, not to corp dev folks, not to the M&A folks, but we actually encouraged them to speak to the product managers at places like Airbnb and Yahoo. And uh, the product managers kind of just loved it. And it was a really small deal because uh, the company had raised less than a million bucks. But we made it happen, and so far we're kind of, we're really up. And there's a key word there, optionality. Um, because we had raised so little mo money, it was easy to generate a profitable exit. And if we had raised lots of money, that would have been a, a, a losing deal. You know, we would have kind of sold it for less than our cost base. So by not raising too much money too quickly, you retain the option to sell profitably kind of every step along the way. Tungle. Um, this is a company that I was an investor in and CFO of uh, directly after Terrascale. Actually, no, I, yeah, so I had one in between. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, Pre-revenue company. It helped, um, it helped you schedule meetings with people outside of the office. So kind of inside the office, you could use Google Apps to see when someone's free, or you could use Microsoft Exchange if heaven help you. You're kind of one of those offices that uses Exchange. And this kind of gave you that same functionality, but with people you were meeting outside of the office. We had raised a seed and a Series A, but like local mind, not a penny of revenue. We did have some thoughts about how uh, we could generate revenue, but you know, none. And so, like Local Mind, lots of free user growth every time. It was a very viral product. You know, if I sent you for every four people that I invited to meet with me, one of them became a Tungle user. Uh, so that kind of drove our user acquisition, and we were integrated with kind of the big calendaring platforms. So Lotus Notes, uh, Google, uh, Blackberry, obviously Microsoft, and, um, and kind of had worked business development deals, co-marketing deals with all of those platforms over time. And Blackberry kind of just started to really take notice. Uh, Blackberry, as you may know, has kind of gone through some troubled times. Uh, this was uh, the early part of their downswing and they thought that the Tungle product could really help modernize their, uh, I think they called it Playbook at the time, that was that tablet thing that they killed. Anyway, Tungle was gonna be kind of a big part of that platform. And so um, we ended up doing a, a deal. Um, wasn't one of those 10 X's, but it was a really, really solid return. Everyone was happy. Um, Blackberry wanted to buy us half cash, half stock. I uh, had a big standoff with them where I insisted it be an all cash deal. That turned out to be a really good thing. And um, <laughs> that was that. Last case study, Go Instant. Uh, Jevin McDonald, a good friend, one of the founders of Startup North blog, a pretty colorful character in the Canadian startup scene. He started this company called Go Instant. He raised a 700K seed round. He raised it from the who's who. Somehow he got Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn to invest, a bunch of shiny names, freestyle capital out of the valley, uh, Boris Wirtz, a bunch of great people. And um, what it did, it was kind of immediate screen sharing technology, but with no need to download a client. It was just like instantaneous screen sharing two-way in the browser. And this was, uh, again, like Terrascale, pretty meaningful technology. But what Jevin did, which was really smart, first of all, you know, he lives in Halifax, and he was down in the valley every two weeks, which is a super pain in the ass, because there's no direct flights. Uh, he had a young kid, he was like killing himself to position his company, first of all to raise the round, and then second to create buzz around his company once he had raised the round. And he was... One thing that was really smart, when he was ever, whenever he was talking about the company, and his product, he wasn't talking about this feature or that feature, he was selling the future. He was talking about 
how screen sharing is dead, like, you know, the incumbent ways of scare, sharing screens are dead, you know, real-time customer support. There's a whole bunch of use cases that are going to be enabled from this technology, and it's going to be completely disruptive. Mark Benioff, founder of Salesforce, heard about this, and it scared the crap out of him because he didn't have a solution. And so he initiated that whole process kind of top down. And because Jevin had really good investors and Mark didn't want to disrespect them, he ended up coming in with a really solid offer. It was announced that that was a $70 million exit. In reality, it was actually higher. And a decent portion of that was in Salesforce stock, which I think tripled subsequently. So uh, Jevin did all right. So what are the lessons learned here? The first is, hope is not a strategy. If I ask any of you founders today, you know, what's your product roadmap? Or what's your go-to-market plan? Or what, kind of, what are the big milestones in your company over the next 3, 6, 9, 12 months? You're probably going to give me a good answer. But if I ask you, what's your exit strategy? And how are you going to sell your company? And who are the buyers? And what are the next steps you're doing to build relationships with them? I'm probably going to get a lot of blank stares. And that is why, if you go back to that thing earlier, like kind of 12 to 1 ratio between companies that get funded and companies that get exit. If you have no idea how you're going to sell your company, even if it's not your intention, but eventually you will, don't be surprised if you don't sell your company, right? Hope is not a strategy. Uh, second, always be closing. Anyone seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? I only love the movie for this scene. I've probably seen this scene 50 times. And uh, in the deal business, I am always closing. And uh, so I'm kind of all over this. And you need to be too as founders. You need to be super aggressive. You know, if you start something, like the world's against you. Investors will hate you until they love you. Customers will be disrespectful. It'll be hard to get employees. Competitors will want to crush you. You need to be always out there closing and getting deals done. And uh, third, you know, if I look back on all the outcomes that I've been a part of that are, were good, um, at least half of them were luck and timing. You know, you can't achieve anything that is worthwhile if you don't get the timing right. And then luck just, you know, if you hustle hard enough, luck just kind of happens, but the timing is a big thing. You know, if I look at my second startup, so the one before TerraScale, we had this amazing IP networking technology that today would be a market killer. But we were doing this in 2002 or something. Uh, so we were just way ahead of the market. And we were trying to convince the market that they needed this thing. And they were just like, go away. You're wasting my time. Uh, so yeah, we lost a lot of money on that. So timing is a thing. Um, kind of some random pieces of insights uh, over the years. There are two types of buyers, if I can completely generalize. Founder-led companies and manager-led companies. So a founder-led company, let's take Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. So Mark is completely in control of that company, notwithstanding the fact that it's a massive public company. It thinks aggressively. It thinks like a startup. And so when it makes acquisitions, it has you know, a specific way of doing them. First of all, they tend to be product-driven. They are based on kind of a desire that is usually top down. Let's take like Instagram as an example, right? You know, a tiny little company, a 13 person company that sold for a billion dollars. And everyone, like that happened because Instagram had massive scale. Everyone was taking photos on it, not on Facebook. It scared the crap out of Mark. And Mark was just like top down. It's like, I need to own that thing and I'm just going to pay whatever it takes to buy it. And everyone thought he overpaid it. It turned out to be a wildly successful and very wise acquisition. And there was really no meaningful prior relationship. He just looked at them, scared the crap out of him, and he bought it. That was it. Contrast that with kind of, you know, professional CEO-led companies like IBM, which is a very, very active buyer of companies. In fact, probably the most active. Their decision to buy a company needs to be very fact-driven. It's been built from the bottom up by corporate development people, uh, line of business executives. There needs to be a very clear business case that gets bubbled up to, you know, if it's large enough, the CEO, but usually kind of a vice president or general manager of a division. 
And there needs to be lots of evidence. It takes time. There needs to be joint customers. There needs to be integration. There needs to be co-marketing. Lots and lots of touch points. These deals take a long time to happen. The issue with most exits, as we talked about earlier, back to the bubble bursting, is that most are really small. Most are sub $50 million. And uh, one of the reasons why I started SurePath is because until you get to about 70, $100 million in market value, there are, let's say, no credible specialized investment bankers that will touch your company, which means that you're either going through that exit process by yourself or you're going through it with someone kind of sketchy who has no idea what they're doing. This is particularly true here in Canada, where the mid-market investment bankers here might have done some like junior resource or mining thing last month, and now they think they know what to do with your fintech startup this month. It's bullshit. So uh, this is why a lot of these exits tend to be kind of nominal and a disappointment across the board. So if you think about that exit process, and you're going through that yourself for the first time, you'll have these really sophisticated corp dev at legal departments that will descend upon you and give you an anal probe, I'm sorry. And at the same time, you gotta run the business and deliver these results because you're under the microscope. And then you're negotiating with your future boss, which is kind of suboptimal on every possible level. And so that leads to a bunch of disappointing nominal exits. Have I depressed everyone yet? Sorry. Uh, what drives deal value? Uh, a bunch of things. First of all, if you have alternatives. And remember I talked about that word optionality before? This is super key. If you build a company that always is growing fast enough with profitable unit economics such that it can raise money if and when it chooses to, or a company that's not burning a hole in the ground and therefore if you need to get profitable cash flow break even, you can, or a company that is sufficiently engaged with it, the buyers in its market such that it could enter into a qualified warm acquisition discussion anytime it can, you have built a company with optionality. It has alternatives. When a buyer reaches out to you, you can choose. I can keep going, I can get to profitability, I can raise money, I am in control, I have leverage. And then, by the way, if you've built relationships with multiple acquirers, then you're not stuck in this one discussion with no ability to generate other discussions. Scarcity, if you are, you know, the 20th marketing technology app for syndicating tweets across social networks, who cares? But if you've built something that is truly unique, truly meaningful, and there's one of you, it matters a lot. Um, mortal enemies, it's really great if you can be in discussions with one tech giant who has a really big enemy who stands, a lot, stands to lose a lot if that giant buys you. So always make sure you're talking to the enemy. Growth, remember we talked about Instagram earlier, growing like stink, scared the crap out of Mark, so he says, I'm gonna buy it. Market leadership, that's a two-way street. If you, are, like, if you think about any market segment, most of the value in that segment will go to the market leader. This is particularly true for kind of enterprise B2B companies. If you are the market leader in your segment, no matter how small it is today, that's gonna to be of great interest to a buyer because they can take it and grow it. Similarly, you want to sell to the market leader, especially if you're getting stock. Because that, what I mentioned earlier about kind of the big difference in value between kind of the leader and the also rands, that applies all the way up the food chain. Um, the rest of the things, you know, you know obviously, obviously a deal's not gonna get done if the CEO wants to do it. But if you're trying to like force a business case up the food chain and the CEO doesn't want to do it, it's going to take a long time. Whereas if the CEO does want to do it, it's going to happen really quickly. Um, currency. So Canada is kind of on sale right now. You know, the Canadian dollar is worth 72 cents US. That's a pretty interesting time to be thinking about M&A. And then timing, we've talked about uh, before. I think I'm running out of time here. So. I'll skip these technical things, just a bunch of things to think about. I'm gonna post these slides later so you can get them be on my blog, Startup CFO. And that's it. Uh, if there's questions, I'll take them now. Otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned mortal enemies. Um, 
you have any advice if you're selling out to a competitor? So where does uh, obviously the due diligence and how, how does that come? Obviously, if it may not come to uh, a deal, how would you negotiate uh, a true competitor? Oh, to you, you're negotiating with your competitor. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So yeah, if you are in a potential acquisition discussion with your own competitor, then you need to show skin really, really slowly. You need to kind of qualify every step of the way. You need to realize that the vast majority of acquisition discussions turn into nothing, and it could just be a fishing expedition. So don't reveal information that would be you know, really detrimental if it was in their hands until the process is really, really qualified. Uh, this is where an intermediary or an exit advisor can be really helpful because hopefully they have dealt with that buyer before. Uh, they can have very candid conversations with them and they can drum up 10, 15 other discussions so you feel like you have a meaningful probability of reaching an exit outcome. But yeah, you really, it's an art form to be honest. It's a great question. But you have to reveal information in a very staged, slow manner. But, but if you, if you're invented the car that runs on water, you could sell it to the oil companies. I guess so, yeah, that would be cool. I would like that. Yep. Um, just given the way the US dollar has gone against Canadian dollar over the past few months, how has that impacted the way VCs, specifically Canadian VCs, are taking investments criteria based on the valuation of the changing between the currencies? Or is it not affecting at all? Uh, yeah, no, the, the Canadian dollar is definitely affecting how Canadian VCs behave. You know, first of all, a lot of rounds are being priced in US dollars, which really sucks if you have a Canadian dominated fund. Uh, so that is happening. I think at the end of the day, so, you know, the best and the worst thing about the Canadian startup market is its proximity to the US startup market. And every company, or almost every company, that uh, gets started here, its primary market for selling its goods and services is the US. And if you want to reach true scale, inevitably you're gonna raise money from the US. And so Canadian investors know that. They're trying to structure their deals to make sure that they are kind of palatable and kind of teed up for US investors. So I think they're just sucking it up, to be honest, in terms of uh, the current you know, foreign exchange environment. Like I just uh, did a deal with BDC recently where they offered the entrepreneur a choice. Like here's the valuation and the price per share in US dollars and we'll fund you in US dollars and here's the same deal but a Canadian dollar deal. But they, they hate it obviously because it's costing them money. Yep. What's the investment thesis for a company like Local Mind that is free revenue like from your perspective? Like are you saying this is like going to get bought and that's what we're hoping for? What's the error? Uh, yeah, so investment thesis for a pre revenue company. So in the case of Local Mind, I, I led the Local Mind deal. And, you know, there's three, I call them, I guess, the, the three P's that are fundamental to any investment decision. Uh, people, product, process, uh, or progress, sorry, or traction. And at the seed stage, you need one of those three. At Series A, you need two of those three. By the time you get to Series B, you need all three. And of the three, traction is the one that matters the most. So when I looked at that deal, uh, they had gone through an accelerator, year one labs. They were already in market. They already had a crap ton of traction. It was a viral product. I loved the team. So I actually was checking two of the three boxes. Actually three, all three, but uh, if I think about it. Um, but I was under no illusions. I didn't think it was gonna be the next Google, uh, which is why it was a small round. Um, so we wanted that optionality. I firmly believed it would be an acquisition. It would become a feature of something else. But it checked more boxes than I usually would get as a seed stage investor. Yep. The examples that you gave today were all M&A examples. Is that because companies going to IPO in Canada as far as technical companies is truly a rarity? Or is, is it something that is a rarity in general? or? or yeah, two of the 94 exits that took place in the last two years were IPOs, Canaxis and Shopify. So yeah, IPOs are quite rare. Um, 
if you look at the performance of tech IPOs in Canada versus those in the US, Canada underperforms in a meaningful way. I think there's a few reasons for that. One, there's just not a ton of institutional investor demand for technology stocks. I think that might be changing a little bit. People have seen Shopify and wondering what the next Shopify is gonna be. But I think there's a difference in management capability as well. You know, I think our companies just haven't grown as fast as the US counterparts. And remember earlier I talked about kind of how growth rate is the thing that drives valuation of your company above all else. So I think that's resulted in an underperformance. So, and I would also say in the last couple of years, if you truly have a growth stage company, there's no good reason for you to go public. It sucks. You know, you've got all this kind of compliance and all this other stuff and do management discussion and analysis every quarter. Your stock goes up and down every day for no reason. Why bother with that? given how much money there is in the private markets. To continue with that, that point, as a founder, you may have, um, you may prefer a particular growth um, path in, in which you may not want to grow as quickly as, let's say, your, your VC, simply because you want to continue, have more control of your company. Yeah. Is that a, generally, a, an area of discussion or contention between the founders versus the... Uh, VCs are completely indifferent to growth rate. They don't care. I'm joking. No, of course, it's a massive discussion. And to be honest, this is why most companies that look to raise VC don't. Because they either don't have the growth rate going in, they don't have that flywheel, they don't necessarily have the ambition, they're not thinking aggressively enough. It's a huge discussion point all the time. And it's also the reason why companies fail to raise kind of follow-on capital, right? 43% of companies that raise a seed, raise a Series A. And half of the companies that raise a Series A, raise a Series B. So there's kind of attrition every step of the way, and very often it's driven by a failure to maintain or accelerate growth. Any other questions? Yep. For a uh, later stage company, um, I was wondering what your thoughts are about uh, discussions about being you know, cash positive. And, you know, some people, you know, highly, you know, think against it, especially in the West Coast. You know, people are like, oh, it's like we need to have just the right amount and not so much uh, so that we can innovate uh, versus, you know, VCs and board members like to, you know, have uh, enough so that, you know, it's to avoid bankruptcy at all costs if, you know, anything. I mean, I was wondering uh, if you had any thoughts about it, quick feedback, feedback about it. Sure. Um, I do. Yeah, so kind of pros and cons of being profitable versus continuing to burn. And the way I think about it, um, so most businesses today are recurring revenue type of businesses where, you know, you acquire a customer on day one, you incur all that cost up front, and then they pay you, you know, monthly or annually or whatever. You recover that investment over X number of months, and then the rest of the time that you keep that customer is profitable. And so the point there is, as long as you have profitable per customer economics, it makes sense to burn money and acquire as many of those profitable cash streams as possible. And that's why you see software as a, software as a service companies, e-commerce companies, marketplace companies burn a hole in the ground because they're actually acquiring, even though they're burning money overall, they're acquiring a bunch of customers that are, each of whom are profitable. So you look at Box, very successful enterprise IPO that happened, I think, in 2014. They completely burned a hole in the ground. They raised tons and tons of money. But the reason why it was a successful IPO is because every customer was not only profitable, but the value of each customer grew 30% every year because it was like a land and expand. It would get into one department, then a second department, blah, blah, blah. This is also why Salesforce, the original software as a service company, had many, many billions in revenue before it turned a penny of profit. It's why Amazon became by far the largest e-commerce retailer before turning a penny of profit. So as long as you're maintaining per customer economics, and as long as there is plentiful capital, it is strategic to acquire more market share as quickly as you can and become the market leader. Should the, market, should the capital dry up, then you need to have a business model that can get you to profitability, you know, before you run out of cash. Good, how are we for time, by the way?
One more? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm a CEO startup, CEO for my company myself, and I was wondering what skill sets uh, do you put in practice in your role as a startup um, CFO to see these companies to exit versus the I can't hear you. Could you speak up a little bit? Sure, sorry. 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 I said I'm a, I'm a CA and a startup CA for making myself, and I was wondering what skill sets and role that you that you have to see these companies through start stage to exit versus another very good CFO. Got it. Okay. Why am I such an amazing CFO? Is that the question? Got it. Okay, good. Yeah. That's a great question. I didn't plant that question. Um, so it's funny. If you think of startup finance, uh, other than when you're raising money, it's a pretty simple job versus kind of big companies. And so the key, I think, to being a great CFO in a startup is to go way beyond finance. You know, you need to be operational. You know, if I look at when, back when I was a CFO, I was running HR, operations, customer support. And the way I thought about it is I wanted to give my CEO the most leverage possible. So if the CEO was very technical, I tried to run as many other functions as possible so that that CEO could spend time building product. If the CEO was a rainmaker and was bringing in all the business, I wanted to kind of run all internal operations so that person was going to be out of the building, bringing in deals and feeling safe. So that was a big part of it. Um, and then, you know, all startups kind of need capital. I happen to be. I've had a long fascination with the venture capital markets, so much so that when I was an auditor, I can't believe I'm gonna admit this to you, but anyway, when I was an auditor, uh, I was auditing a technology company, I ended up joining them as their first CFO, and I was so in love with venture capital that I actually called up the VC to ask him if he had any questions about the financial statements, and he, would, he was totally weirded out because he didn't even read the statements, he didn't care. But it's like, why the hell is this auditor calling me? But I just wanted to talk to a VC. That VC, by the way, was David Lowy, who, a uh, Canadian guy, used to run Mosaic Ventures. He now runs Google Capital. He was the initial corp dev leader in Google. He's like an amazing guy. And I cold called him uh, and probably weirded him out uh, many years ago. So uh, the point of all that is I had a deep passion for venture capital and as a result became very proficient at raising money for companies. And so as a CFO, if you can pay your way by going in and helping a company raise many millions of dollars, you're going to have a job, you know? So that turned out to be a thing as well. So going way beyond finance and being very skilled at raising capital. Thank you very much.